In 1987, writer and first-time director Clive Barker unleashed the film Hellraiser on the world, based on his 1986 novella The Hellbound Heart. The film's original budget was around $1 million, but it grossed an estimated $20 million at the box office. And as of late 2021, the original had lent to nine sequels and a couple of remakes that have been stalled in development hell. The film gave birth to one of the most iconic horror characters in film history. Pinhead, aka the Hell Priest, portrayed brilliantly by Doug Bradley. The series, however, hasn't exactly had the best track record with quality, but as of October 2022, we're getting a new interpretation of the Hell Priest, or in this case, the Hell Priestess in Hulu's Hellraiser, starring Jamie Clayton as Pinhead. So get comfy, crack open your lament configurations, as I have such sights to show you, ghouls and ghoulettes. Today, we're going to be looking at 10 fun facts the Hellraiser franchise. What's happening my fellow ghouls and ghoulettes? Welcome to a brand new episode of Cosplay Chris. And as that intro suggests, we're looking at 10 fun little facts about the Hellraiser franchise. With the lead up to the release of Hulu's Hellraiser this week, I thought it'd be fun to revisit the Hellraiser franchise with some little tidbits here and there that not many people know about. I've tried to source some really niche bits of trivia. They're a lot of fun. One that includes Australia. So with that being said, perfect segue. Let's start off with number 10. Number 10, banned in Queensland. So the state that I live in in Australia is New South Wales. The state above me is Queensland. And during the 80s, Queensland was very strict with what they put out on video. I guess it was the equivalent to video nasties in the UK, or as they say, video nasties. So much so that during the 80s, Queensland banned on VHS Friday the 13th Part 2, A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. The film was actually banned for an entire year in terms of being released on VHS. And when it was finally released on VHS, it was slapped with a little sticker on the front of the VHS saying banned in Queensland. So if you owned a VHS store in Queensland, you were unable to stock this. But there were certain VHS store owners that were in a special union that were getting this video in on the slide and offering it to the general public. Now this combo VHS package that you see right here of the first and second Hellraiser is such a rarity these days. It goes for an absolute mint on eBay. I myself had tried to find it for the longest time because I remember going to the video shop when I was a kid and seeing that sticker on it and also the back of the VHS. I mean look at all the horrific stuff they had on the back. Like VHS cover designers didn't hold back in the 80s and early 90s ghouls and ghoulettes. And there you have it. Number 10, banned in Queensland. Number 9, Freddy vs Jason vs Pinhead. Now, as a lot of you know, Freddy vs. Jason went through development hell with utmost of 10 plus scripts being done up to like the 20 something mark of rewrites and different pitches and stories and whatnot. And one of the endings that was pitched for Freddy vs. Jason was when Freddy and Jason have come down to hell at the end of the film, they're greeted by Pinhead. It's Freddy and Jason about to have a clash of the titans in the bowels of hell when all of a sudden chains grab them and pull them apart. We then see Pinhead, played by Doug Bradley supposedly, rise up from the ashes in hell and say, okay gentlemen, what seems to be the problem. This would have been such a neat little easter egg and such a cool concept, but unfortunately, New Line did not have the rights, nor could they acquire the rights to Pinhead. So unfortunately, that ending was scrapped. But nonetheless, it is really fun to think about. That could have been just oh so good. Nice little tidbit at the end, and then cut to black. Number eight, Captain Elliot Spencer. So in Hellbound Hellraiser 2, we actually get to see Pinhead's origins. He was once a human. He was a man by the name of Captain Elliot Spencer. And during World War I, Elliot Spencer served as a captain in the British Expeditory Force. He was a charismatic and eloquent man. However, after participating in one of the battles of Flanders, And as for you, I don't know you, but I'm sure you're a jerk. He loses his faith in humanity after witnessing the inhumanity enacted upon one another. He loses faith in God. He loses faith in mankind and that is where Captain Elliot Spencer stumbles upon the lament configuration box thus opening it and then his transformation into Pinhead. And what I really like about this is they do ground Pinhead. They make him human. He was once a human, so you kind of feel empathy for him. And plus the fact that Doug Bradley gets to not wear any makeup in some scenes of Hellbound and it must have been a blast for him and just really refreshing just to wear the costume. Number seven, using old scripts. 
So it's been rumored that a few Hellraiser scripts weren't actually Hellraiser based scripts. They were spec scripts with a completely different story. They just happened to slap the character of Pinhead and the world of Hellraiser within them just so they had something to make. So originally I always heard that Hellraiser Inferno did the same thing. But in terms of Hellraiser Hellseeker, apparently this is the case. Hellseeker was originally a non-Hellraiser related script owned by Dimension Film and to save money on writing a completely original Hellraiser story, the script was quickly edited to insert the Cenobites and references to Kirstie Cotton's past within them. A scene written specifically to try and bring the largely unrelated plot in line with the canon of the first two Hellraiser films was subsequently cut, but it's actually available on the DVD of Hellseeker as a special feature. Goddamn Weinsteins, man. Number six, Halloween. So after the huge success of Freddy vs. Jason sweeping the box office, and it was actually the biggest box office success for both the Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street franchises, writers got together and studios got together to pitch the idea of Michael Myers vs. Pinhead entitled Halloween. And back in the 1990s, filmmaker Dave Parker from The Hills Run Red and Tales of Halloween had pitched an idea for Freddy vs. Jason at Sean Cunningham's company, but the pitch was actually unsuccessful. However, it got him thinking about other possible crossovers, and he realized that Dimension at the time had owned the rights to both Halloween and Hellraiser. And Parker goes on to say, I was just trying to come up with a plausible way to get these two guys together to fight. So Parker goes on to say, the story takes place when people try to destroy the Myers house and they find the lament configuration box hidden between the walls. Of course, they open it and Pinhead shows up and it's Halloween and it's the Myers house. So Michael shows up because there are people there and Pinhead recognizes that Michael is Samhain, or should I say, Sawin, which begins this whole battle in the real world. And of course, the third act takes them all to hell. The idea of this sounds batshit crazy, but put to film, it would have been a blast to see. And it's actually quite an interesting concept when you think about it. It's the right place, the right time for these two slashes to meet. One thinks it's the other. Pinhead obviously thinks Michael is Sawin and then that's how they fight and they end up in hell for the third act. I would have loved to have seen that. But unfortunately Dimension weren't on board. They were obviously interested in reusing old scripts and slapping a Hellraiser story on them. Number five, ignoring Pinhead. Now when it comes to creature makeup, it can be very intense, very heavy, and to the point where you cannot even recognize an actor. So when it came time for the rap party of the first Hellraiser in 1987, Doug Bradley turned up without his pinhead makeup. To his dismay, a lot of the crew were ignoring him and just treating him as a guy that just wandered in off the street, having no idea that they had no idea who he was because for the most part, they have just been working with Pinhead. They never saw Doug Bradley go into the makeup trailer, into the makeup chair, apply all that makeup. They just saw Pinhead come out, come onto set, do his lines, and his rap for the day. So apparently Doug Bradley got pretty shitty about this until he put two and two together and realized, oh right, some of them don't recognize me. Shit, I hope they all settled it with a big pint. Number four, changing chatterer. So in the first and second Hellraiser, the Chatterer was played by actor Nicholas Vince, who did a phenomenal job given that he wasn't able to see in the first one, given the Chatterer had no eyes. But when it came to the second Hellraiser, Nicholas Vince made a massive request. He wanted eyes in this mask, not just prop eyes, but his actual eyes showing through with blended makeup on the actual foam latex appliance. And what we get in terms of the design of Chatterer in Hellbound Hellraiser 2 is actually something very jarring and unpopular opinion, I prefer the look of Chatterer from Hellbound compared to the first Hellraiser. There's just something so haunting about those eyes. I think because they're obviously Nicholas Vince's eyes, but they're so human. They just have so much humanity in them because they're real. They're not prop eyes. They're not animatronic eyes. They're not lenses that he's trying to see through like sunglasses per se. They're actual eyes, and to me, that's so much more haunting. Now, it's stated that Nicholas Vince disliked working blind so much that he asked to have holes in the mask for his eyes, and the filmmakers agreed to change for Hellbound Hellraiser 2. It was a necessary decision to make since one particular scene required the Chatterer to chase the film's heroines down a hall. So that makes total sense, otherwise you're just gonna be smashing into walls, you're gonna have to try your best to, to memorize your footsteps, your running steps, and it's a lot harder when you're running as opposed to walking in a straight line. Nonetheless, I think it's a really cool design, a really cool change, but I always will have a soft spot for the original Chatterer, but with the eyes, it just looks so much more creepy. Number three, Alan Smithy. 
Now here's not only a bit of Hellraiser trivia, but film trivia in general. Alan Smithy is an official synonym used by film directors who wish to disown a project. So essentially, if you're a director, if you've made a film and you want to shun it, if you don't want to borrow it anymore, you can remove your name and the movie studio will put in the synonym Alan Smithy. This was the case for legendary makeup artist Kevin Yeager, who originally directed Hellraiser Bloodline. It was his first time in the director's chair. A lot of you guys will know Kevin Yeager from doing the Freddy Krueger makeup for Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, which in my opinion is one of the best Freddy makeups out there in terms of Freddy being truly scary. Kevin also created the original Chucky animatronic for the Child's Play films. He's done great work on Sleepy Hollow, Face Off, Bill and Ted, and he got the opportunity to direct a Hellraiser film. Now, apparently on set, it was literal hell with the Weinsteins, and subsequently at the end of it, he wanted to have his name removed. So that's why you see directed by Alan Smithy in Hellraiser Bloodline. It was really directed by Kevin Yeager, but he opted to have that synonym in place. Goddamn Weinsteins, man. Number two, international titles. Now here's an interesting little one. Because some language translations end up very different to what it is in English, the titles for the original Hellraiser were very different. So in Croatia, Hellraiser was known as Lords of Hell. In France, as The Pact. In India, as Son of the Devil in Mexico as Door to Hell, in Portugal as Curse Fire, in Serbia as Lords of Hell, and in Taiwan as Raise Ghosts and Eat People. That sounds like a fun Saturday night. Again, quick little fun fact, but with that being said, on to number one. And number one, Nailhead. So like I said with fun fact number five, creature makeup can be very intense, very heavy, but you also have to do your tests. A lot of test footage, test fittings, just to make sure things work, see if things don't work, swap things out. And in this case, you see these photos right here. These are the first test photos of Doug Bradley in his original pinhead makeup. And I literally mean pinhead makeup because the aesthetic they were going for were actual pins and they're so thin the camera could barely pick them up as you could see right here. They needed some sort of reflection and there just wasn't enough surface area for those pins to pick up any reflection for that matter. So what did they have to do? They had to go for the aesthetic of nails. Now, from my understanding from the amazing documentary Leviathan about Hellraiser 1 and 2, I highly recommend checking it out. It's a brilliant watch. Much like Crystal Lake Memories and Never Sleep Again, The Elm Street Legacy, the makeup artists were frantically scrambling trying to figure out how to make these pins reflect light because they were using the aesthetic of pins. They're too thin. They would then get some hobby pipes, some thin hobby pipe that was just thick enough to reflect light when you've got the camera on it and you've got the lighting rig on it. So one by one, they would make all these armatures that would slide onto Doug Brad these makeup, also glue these pinheads on one by one, and what we got are the famous pinheads, but they have the aesthetic of nails. So technically, he's called Nailhead. Nailed it. And there you go, ghouls and ghoulettes. 10 fun little facts about the Hellraiser franchise in the lead up to Hulu's Hellraiser starring Jamie Clayton as Pinhead that is gonna be dropping this week. I'm very excited about that, and I will have my review up for that as soon as it hits. So with that being said, let me know your favorite piece of Hellraiser trivia down below and your favorite moments in the franchise. Granted, towards the end, it, it didn't have the best track record, but nonetheless, I wanna know what your favorite moments are from the film. So with that being said, wherever you are in the world, please have yourselves an absolute cracker of a day. I hope you're well, hope you're happy, be merry, be silly. And until next time, ghouls and ghoulettes, please always remember, cosplayers do it best.